everybody and welcome. This is uh, the Apostate Prophet. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Lately, I have been trying to get in touch with a very important guest, and uh, finally, we made it happen. Today, I want to talk to uh, Michaela Peterson. Hi, Michaela. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for bringing me on. Sorry it took so long to get this worked out. This year's been crazy. I know you are busy, so it's it's completely understandable. I suffer from the same problems. Uh, <laughs> it's great that we eventually uh, did it, and I'm very happy to have you here. So, how are you doing? How is your well? How is your health? Not wealth. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Things are good. I just uh, relocated from Nashville to Miami, and I'm really enjoying Florida, even though it's ridiculously hot out right now. So things are better. Um, I was quite sick this year with bronchitis from tree allergies in Nashville, which is part of the reason it took us so long to get connected because I kept losing my voice. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good right now. That's good to hear. That's, that's, that's very good to hear. How is your, um, speaking of health, you had a whole thing going on this. Um, you started a, 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 a diet and a program and a company based on that, I believe. Um, you ran with that for a while. How, how is that going? Are you continuing with that? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much stuck on that diet. That's That caused a bit of controversy. It's an all-meat diet. So I just eat, like, beef, lamb, ruminant animals. Um, and I'm pretty much stuck on the diet to treat my rheumatoid arthritis. So I had rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I've had symptoms since I was two, and it was extremely severe. I had my hip and ankle replaced when I was 17. So it wasn't like a couple of joints hurt. It was literally destroying my body. Uh, and I managed to put it into remission with this really extreme uh, diet. And there's some theories about why it works, but I'm kind of stuck on it. And so I've been telling people about it, obviously. Um, I don't have, I'm not making any money from it. Although if I figure out a way, I most certainly will. I'm not opposed to making money, but I've just been telling people about it because it changed my life so dramatically that I felt I should. So I don't focus on that really. I focus on my podcast, but uh, yes, I'm stuck on the diet currently. If I go off of it, my autoimmune disorder comes back. Um, I, I have been dealing with, um, I've dealt with an autoimmune disorder and also with, um, actually I noticed your diet when I had uh, major anxiety problems uh, several years back. And uh, just around that time, I saw the, um, your, uh, your, your diet and um, you promoting it. And I saw things relate to anxiety and that diet mm -hmm. so i thought about uh maybe trying it because i was just looking for a way to manage things better but in the end i uh i, I couldn't do it because i wasn't committed enough to just eat meat but <laughs> well that's it's understandable it's not like it's really tricky to get into uh i so i used it for the arthritis and but the really crippling illness i had was major depressive disorder which was just like destroying my life um, I had chronic fatigue as well. And so I, I started, I actually started on a paleo diet. So I got rid of all the processed foods and grains and soy and dairy. And I just ate mostly like vegetables, meat and fruit. And that made a massive difference to my depression before I went to just a meat diet. So if you're not feeling up to a meat diet, most people aren't, then even cutting grains and dairy and processed foods, sometimes that's enough to see a difference in mood. Well, there's, uh, different ways to achieve. I, I mean, I'm really, I'm really happy that it works for you. I'm really happy that uh, it makes great changes in your health. It's, it's great to see people free themselves from such suffering. You don't know how hard it is until you experience it. And it's hard to explain to others. Yeah. Uh, if we're not familiar with it. Um, coming to your podcast, um, you started a podcast where you, um, I, I believe you didn't uh, focus on a specific topic, right? You would just wanted to um, host interesting people, have all kinds of discussions with uh, people that you are interested in who might share your views or not. Uh, how did that start? Uh, it started, I guess I'd been on a number of podcasts talking about my experience with diet. Um, and somebody reached out and said, you should start a podcast. And I thought, okay, why not? I like talking to people. And so I started it kind of to delve into more alternative health, uh, I guess, theories. So I had a lot of practitioners on, like really out there practitioners um, for alternative health things just to, when, if you're diagnosed with like an autoimmune disorder or some sort of problem, you kind of 
look everywhere for a solution. So I had a lot of those practitioners practitioners on. And then once I kind of got bored, honestly, of the health route, I um, I had some people talk about politics. Uh, or And then when I kind of got bored of that, uh, I spoke with a lot of people who were successful business people to ta- try and see how they'd become so successful. So what the pattern was amongst people who'd made a lot of money. I did that for a while. And then I started doing a po- an opposing views series um, where I talk to somebody on the right and somebody on the left generally, uh, or people with completely differing views on a contentious subject. And I'll ask them the same questions and then um, put those videos up. So I try and stay as neutral as I can, uh, just to showcase how different opinions can be. That's been very interesting too. What is your expectation from, uh, I will come to that um, in a little bit more specifically, because that's actually one of the main reasons why I uh, contacted you and uh, and asked to talk to you uh, because of uh, one of those episodes. But um, what, what's your expectation from the from the opposing views uh, series and podcast? Like, um, do you just, do you have this goal of simply being a, um, a moderator or not even a moderator, just, just an interviewer who just asks questions and lets the others speak no matter what they want to say? Or are you trying to find a common ground? Is there a specific goal that you're going for? So, no. Uh, I, I think I've actually tried to stay as out of the conversation as possible. It's hard sometimes because sometimes I'll, there'll be a topic and I will clearly agree with one of the sides. And then it's difficult to stay neutral. Uh, and that's happened quite a few times, but I'm trying to s- stay out of it completely. I think the only way to make that kind of series successful is if I'm just there listening. Uh, if it turns into a debate, then I don't, I don't think it would be successful. So I guess my goal is to stay neutral and then let the audience decide after hearing people's opinions. It would be kind of funny if you were in the middle and then you suddenly in the middle of it start uh, arguing and fighting with, the, with one person. <laughs> It's tempting. It's definitely been tempting, but I'm trying to re- refrain myself. About your, uh, well, you recently got married, right? Congratulations yes. on, on, that, on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been following that. And, and has there also been a journey um, alongside with that of uh, religious beliefs or anything like that? I, I heard that you yeah. recently changed your beliefs or, or something like that. Yeah, um, I guess I converted to Christianity in August last August, um, pretty out of the blue, but not too out of the blue, I suppose. Like I had a, um, I didn't exactly have a Christian upbringing. Like we never went to church or anything, but my dad being Jordan Peterson, it was like, I learned a lot about the biblical stories. And then a few years ago, my mom converted to Catholicism, um, after she had this absolutely like deadly, horrifying, awful cancer. And, uh, that just like tore my family apart and she converted to Catholicism while she was in the hospital with that. Uh, yeah. And, um, I think that watching her, like, I I know not everyone, I mean, you, obviously, I know not everyone has a good experience with religion, but for my mom, it helped her become a kinder person and it was pretty dramatic. And so I kind of saw that. And at the time I was dealing with taking care of my dad, uh, doing primary care. He was really sick and my life was just in shambles and my family's life was in shambles and things were so dramatic. We were dealing with, you know, the media finding out about things. So it wasn't just having parents that are sick and having this family kind of strife because people are sick. It was also dealing with the media. And I was like, this is too much for any person to like understand and so I think things were so surreal for a while that that probably brought me close to closer to uh, spirituality. And then um, for whatever reason, last August, I had an experience that just kind of tipped the scales uh, into me deciding, OK, it makes more sense if God is real, which mm-hmm. isn't something I had thought before. So it's been um, it's been an interesting year. I mean, you might think about me that I uh, probably despise religion because I had a bad experience with it. But it's, I mean, um, I've always thought, even yesterday, I had a conversation with my wife, um, a long one, which was about how, um, you know, religion or um, rituals or specific, uh, you know, behaviors like meditation and things like that um, can just give you 
great comfort. It doesn't even have to be um, a ritual. It doesn't have to be meditation. Just the thought of believing in something, in something oh, yeah. greater, trusting in something can make uh, can make you feel much more comfortable. Can make your life. Uh, better in a sense and i appreciate that aspect very much and you know i understand that people uh get a lot of comfort out of that sometimes i even feel like uh i th that's one aspect that i miss as an atheist about religion but then there are also yeah. other aspects <laughs> yeah well i think for me like i was always pretty skeptical i don't think i was ever a, a, like pure atheist but i was definitely agnostic and uh and I always thought, oh, well, it would be a lot easier if I just believed in something. Like, it would just be a lot easier if I, if I trusted in something or I trusted even an afterlife. You know, if I didn't have this fear, if I just had the belief, life would be easier. And so I had like a number of coincidental things happened and kind of synchronous experiences for a number of years. And things got weird enough that I was like, okay, I think it's God. And my life has improved since then. And that's like, that's good enough for me, really. So I've been reading the Bible and delving into that and my life is better. So, and I, I think through, because of the chronic illness I had and then watching my parents uh, sick for a number of years, I, I think the fact that it's easier and I'll take, like, I'll take it. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not ready to fight back against something and make my life more difficult than it's already been. Yeah. And I was, I was very religious in my past. And um, right now the outlook that I have is um, as long as people don't, um, you know, uh, harm others um, with their religion or in the name of their religion or by yeah. using religion as a tool, it's, yeah. I, I sympathize with people uh, being religious and it's completely fine with me if people want to, um, I'm, I'm saying it's fine with me as if I was an authority in deciding what people can uh, live by. But uh, I, I mean, I, I, I find it, I sympathize with it briefly. Yeah, somewhat. I get that. That's kind of where I was at before too. It was like, just don't, not shove it down my throat, but kind of like, don't shove it down my throat. And yeah, you shouldn't be out harming people because of what you believe. And if that's part of your religion, that's not good. Right. That shouldn't be part of your religion if it involves hurting other people or having an excuse to hurt other people. Mm -hmm. What about Jordan Peterson? I know uh, people probably ask you about uh, your father a lot. I want to make this more about you. But uh, speaking of uh, belief, I hear a lot of claims by people. Uh, people say, no, he's a Christian. No, he's not. He believes in God. No, he doesn't. He's just you know, believes in an in a, in a kind of deity and stuff like that in, in your esteem at the current state if you can even make such a judgment uh does he also believe in god or is he also a christian or what, what is the latest so even me being his daughter it's kind of difficult to tell i think at the moment i would say he believes in god um i think that him watching my mom convert to Catholicism and seeing the changes it made for her helped a lot. I think his experience over the last six or seven years of just strange things happening, like his, his life, you know, just regular university professor to like skyrocketing to fame and then the controversy, all those strange things happening and then him getting super ill, my mom getting super ill. I think all those experiences, um, have led him to believing in God. Uh, I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't say he's a full blown Christian, um, but I don't know what's going to happen. He's definitely interested in in talking about the psychological significance behind the biblical stories and why it's important. And he definitely believes that Christianity specifically is a good religion, um, but. And I, that's probably the best kind of answer I can give you. I, I wouldn't pinpoint it any more because I don't know any better than what I've just told you. Well, I think that is good enough. I feel like if you wanted to describe, you could go on forever. <laughs> but I, I, I think that's, that's good enough uh, for now. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, no problem. When it comes to choosing a religion, um, why are you not a Muslim? <laughs> Um, I think, stupid, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I've actually been asked that before. Is like, why specifically Christianity? And 
I think, first of all, this was just last August, so I haven't delved, delved around very much. But the reason that I've um, converted to Christianity specifically is because I've met a lot of, so a couple of things. Um, when I found God, that's how I'm describing it. When I found God in August, it was kind of through my current husband. So I went to Austin and there were like four parts of my life that were going really badly. And my dad was really sick. There were a couple of things at work that were unbelievably stressful. I was actually going through a divorce that had been going on for a very, very long time. Um, and things, I wasn't depressed, like clinically depressed, like, uh, depression when you don't know what the cause is and you're just miserable. I wasn't like that. I was like, there are hard parts of my life and I'm sad. <laughs> uh, and he said, oh, well, you need God. And I thought, well, that's all fine and dandy. Um, but I don't have that. It sounds good, but I don't have that. And I told him that. I was like, that sounds good, but I don't know how to get that. And I'd probably been looking because my mom had said the same thing when she converted. And I was like, well, I'm looking, but I don't have that. Um, and he said, well, ask God to reveal himself to you. And so I went back home and prayed and was just like, if there's anything out there, say something. And the next day, um, those four parts of my life that were going in the wrong direction and had been going in the wrong direction for like years turned around like enough that I was like, that's enough for me. That was weird. It like, it could have happened. You know, it's not like it, it could have happened. There was a universe that that could have happened, but it was very unlikely. And it happened today. And I woke up with a kind of a feeling of calm that I hadn't had before. And I was like, that's enough for me. And so I think Christianity specifically, partly because of my husband, partly because that's the religion I'm familiar with through my like parents and extended family. Um, and partly because I think reading the Bible has resonated with me in a certain way. But that, that being said, I haven't read other texts, so I don't have that comparison. Um, and then I guess the last reason would be I've met a lot of different families with different religions and it, I feel like the people who practice Christianity have overwhelmingly been very solid, kind people with well-structured families. Um, most of the people I was around growing up had pretty fractured families. So either fighting or divorces, um, something like that. And I feel like if I look back over my life, the families that I realized were stable were the ones that were practicing Christianity. And so that's probably why. How about your, uh, I was just asking tongue in cheek, but uh, to be to be serious for a second. Um, in the past, uh, in the recent past, you made some experiences with uh, Islam. Um, you talked to Ayan Hirsi Ali, and um, then you also had an episode of uh, opposing views where you talked to Ayan Hirsi Ali and to a Muslim apologist. Mm -hmm. With that in mind and with, you know, other experiences and confrontations that you've had so far, what is your impression of Islam? And do you think that it is um, a religion like Christianity or that it is also good in some aspect? And I'm asking that as an ex-Muslim. Um, well, I'm, I don't know enough about it, um, but when I did the Opposing Views episode, um, I asked uh, the apologist, you know, what, what's the difference between, you know, Christianity or like, you know, what's the difference really between Islam and Christianity? And he basically said uh, that Christianity is based on forgiveness. If somebody does something against you, you forgive them and that that was weak. And in Islam, that's not what you do and they should be punished. And I was like, okay, well, if that's what Islam is, that's not what I believe. It's not, I don't believe that it's up to an individual to punish another individual. And I think that that's hard on both people. Uh, and I don't think that's the right way to live. So if that's what the religion's about, um, I don't agree with that. Uh, I have Islamic friends. Uh, and I mean, I get along with a whole bunch of them. But I would say, one, I'm not very educated in the religion. And then two... I know that specifically after that Opposing Views episode, I was upset afterwards, um, like quite upset, right? I, I talked to Ayan and 
I like her. Um, and, and I felt like the person who was opposing her was very mean in a, in a way that scared me. So when I left the episode, I was frustrated and like a little bit scared and I don't get scared that easily, but I was like, if that's what the, if that's what the religion is and that's what a person who believes in that religion is like, that scares me. So <laughs> that's not super positive. I do have um, Muslim friends that I quite like that are very nice people, but specifically with that Opposing Views episode, uh, it was scary. I mean, the thing is, uh, the person you talked to, I mean, Mohammed Hijab, the person that you talked to is also, um, happens to be uh, one of the top three Muslim apologists uh, right now online, or top yeah. five, top three. He's like one of the most popular people. He's uh, the representative of the Muslim youth online right now. And uh, yeah. they vastly agree with him and you know applaud him and the things that he says. And I watched the whole episode. I even um, sat down and... Uh, made a whole life reaction to it. Uh, and and I, I saw your reactions at some points and it looked like you felt really uncomfortable and you really wanted to jump in. And there was one point where you even, um, where he went on a tangent on, on yeah. attacking her and you said, okay, okay, enough. And, and kind of stopped him. And, uh, and, and there was a lot of stuff about, um, I believe you might've heard a lot of things about Islam and women and then in that episode, you actually heard those things directly from a Muslim apologist. Uh, what's your idea yeah. on that? Did you have like these things that are that are uh, known as stereotypes before, and then uh, you heard them from a Muslim apologist? And you know, how how did your ideas <laughs> about Islam and women uh, be, you know, change after that? Uh, yeah, I think actually after that conversation, I was probably. You know, you hear kind of right wing propaganda about Islam and you're like, well, is that true? Who knows? And then you kind of hear more left wing people and they're saying, oh, you know, it's a freeing religion and women can do what they want. Right. And it's like, OK, maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. It didn't seem like it was somewhere in the middle after that opposing views episode. It sounded pretty rough in and uh, it sounded pretty rough. Uh, so I think I was probably more convinced that if that really, like, just honestly, if that religion is the one that's spreading through Europe, we might be in for a bit of an issue, especially in regards to women's rights. And I can kind of understand, like, if I try hard, I can kind of understand where Muhammad was coming from, because I think that there's some response to the left uh, and you know, their dislike of any type of stereotyping gender wise. So it's like, oh no, there's no differences between men and women. Right. And I think part of, I don't know this, but I think part of the reason he's so adamant in his views, I could be wrong, is because there's this thing he's fighting back, which is this ideology that's saying men and women are exactly the same. And I think that that ideology is kind of evil. So I can kind of understand where he's coming from, but I think if we go the route that he was suggesting, then we're going back, I don't know how many hundreds of years in a direction where uh, women aren't going to have any rights under the guise that it's better for them and society that way. And that's not something I agree with at all, obviously. You have conservative values your father is known to have uh, you know, conservative values that are however uh, based on a um a western uh liberal understanding mm -hmm. of society and i mean you feel comfortable and happy as a free woman who can make her own uh choices and her own life decisions and all of that uh, jordan peterson is very big on individualism um as i've seen in the past and uh when it, when it comes to islam Islam doesn't have, uh, I said this quite recently, but uh, for example, when it comes to the, the abortion debate, uh, some Christians uh, get this false impression that their views and their concerns for society are actually uh, very much in alignment with, uh, with, with Islam and Muslims and their uh, concerns for society. But um, I would say that the Islamic uh, 
ideal society is far more distant from the Western conservative or Christian conservative ideal than than Western um, progressivism is, for example. And progressives and conservatives are actually, uh, if you look at it uh, from a broader angle, very close to each other, whereas uh, the Islamic perspective is completely opposed to both of them. Uh, Muslims might say, uh, we care about family values, family values are being destroyed right now, we want to uphold family values, but their family values are not really the family values that you speak of. You call them family values, but you believe in, you know, um, a man and a woman and uh, children and uh, certain gender roles to certain extent uh the islamic position however is that it's okay or ideal for one man to be the patriarch who has multiple wives uh and then also uh dependent uh, slaves or servants that can also be used for sex uh which these muslim apologies apologists believe in by the way and that a man can uh, beat his wife to to regulate her and things like these and the woman doesn't have any freedom for herself at all she must be completely obedient to her husband in every aspect and cannot go i mean you couldn't be sitting here and having this conversation with me under an ideal islamic uh system so (laughs) yeah i felt that i I felt that i think with the opposing views with muhammad because i don't think he was looking at me the entire time i think he was looking off so he wasn't looking at me and i was like ah like this is this is this is real this is like, I'm taught, like, the, he wasn't talking to me, right? He was doing the opposing views so the video could go out, right? So he could get views. Um, so I, I noticed that during the opposing views too. I was like, he definitely didn't look at me the entire time. Um, why do you think, why do you think it's spreading so rapidly in Europe? And why do you think people who are more progressive think that it's okay? Is it just complete lack of understanding? It's not really spreading in that many people are accepting Islam or anything like that. That's usually a misconception. Uh, it's, it's spreading, um, and Pew Research made a study on this um, quite a few years ago, uh, where they pointed out that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world at the moment, but uh, 99.7% of the growth, or 99.3, um, I don't know if I remember the number correctly, but a very small difference, uh, 99.7% of the growth is due to birth rates and yeah, uh, young okay. age, whereas only a tiny amount is due to conversions and you know obviously there's a lot of moving into the western world from the muslim world because the muslim world is not an ideal place to live and i know this from my own experience as well i was born in germany and grew up there and was surrounded by many other muslim families from different countries who came there because life is better in the west and when it comes to the uh the whole progressive um progressives defending Islam, I think it's just this whole naive idea of um, being compassionate and protecting the minorities. And it could be, I mean, it, it, it looks like they have good intentions. They, uh, they think right-wingers uh, are bigoted and hateful and prejudiced. So they want to stand up and protect the minorities, but they don't even think much further. They don't know what Islam is. They don't consider the fact that Islam is not a minority in uh, most of the world and that it has considerable power in the Islamic world and that it is responsible for uh, oppressions and so on. And the average progressive doesn't know that in uh in a dozen muslim countries it is illegal to leave islam and punishable with uh prison fines death and more for example uh i don't know if you are even aware of this i mean uh many people who are not on the on that side are not aware of that but in multiple countries in over 10 countries leaving islam is forbidden and in some of them it is punishable by death you know that is the islamic society yeah, yeah. Okay. That doesn't surprise me. But like I said, I'm not, I'm not well versed enough in this. Plus, there's different, like you talk to different people, and then they'll say different things. And then because I can't read the original text, I don't know how I'm supposed to get the answers. And so if I'm like, even like I, I worked my way through part of the Quran when I was in just the first couple of years of university. Uh, and even that was like, well, it's not in the right language. So you didn't actually read it. Like, well, how am I even supposed to have a conversation? It's like, well, you're not really. <laughs> 
Well, I wanted to make a, a surprise and present something to you so that uh, you don't have to just depend on me telling you everything because I could be, you know, I could have personal biases and all that. So I thought um, I handpicked um, five moments, uh, five instances, uh, or five Muslim apologists and scholars. And uh, I just wonder what your reaction to those uh, would be. Uh, just so that, just so you don't hear it all from me, but you know, from- Okay, from okay, me. let's do it. <laughs> all right, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> let's go. This is a part of a religion, there's a reason to it, yeah? There's a reason why there's a capital punishment because people like you, little weaklings who leave their religion and cause uh, corruption in the land by spreading it, the capital punishment in Islamic law would be applied to you, we have no doubt, and we're proud of that. Yes, and we, you know what, we'll be watching. Oh my gosh, that's terrifying. Yeah, okay. That's kind of, uh, after I did the opposing views too. Oh, here's the other crazy thing that happened. My, when my dad, uh, my dad actually talked to Ayan on his channel. And that was, I think the first, he, he had some actual um, Islamic scholars on after that, but he talked to Ayan first. I actually got people calling my phone number um, demanding to either talk to me or my dad about the episode, insulting me. And I, I, this was when my dad was still kind of sick and there was one guy, I don't know how he got my phone number and he was angry, like angry. And I can remember being like, you know, first, how dare you call me at home? You have no idea who I am. You don't know what my views are. Like you're yelling at somebody on the internet's daughter for a video her dad put out, how does that make you feel? And eventually he was like, oh, I'm really sorry. Like, I shouldn't have done that. It's like, yeah, but like, you wound yourself up and call me at home. Like, that's crazy. That is definitely a concerning clip. And he has 800,000 subs. Yeah, 800,000 subs. Yeah. He's uh, the most popular uh, Muslim YouTuber. And that video was, by the way, addressed uh, at me. Uh, so he's 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 talking to me in that video. Beautiful. And yeah. he's basically saying people like me, little weaklings who leave their religion and then spread corruption, meaning we just we talk about it, uh, that we should be executed and that he would be, that Muslims like him, his words, would be proudly watching. And yeah, see, I can't imagine that coming. Um, like, I, I, there aren't Christians online that I'm aware of with that kind of rhetoric. I'm just, uh, I might not be aware of them, but I don't think that really exists in Christianity specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, next, next one. Oh, the next one is going to be a screenshot. I love how so many of these Islamophobes don't have the ability to represent me fairly by calling this child rape. How is it child rape when there is parental consent? <laughs> See, the, that's crazy, but that's part of the reason that's crazy other than what he's talking about is because he actually doesn't understand, right? He's, he's actually like, how is it child rape if there's parental consent? It's like, how can you ask that question? But he actually doesn't understand, which is even scarier. Yeah, wow. it's, it's like it's like it doesn't even make sense to him. It's like yeah, the, the yeah. parents consented to it. So what are you talking about? How how is yeah? This why would I be in trouble if the parents consented? Yeah, whoa. And the context of this was we were talking about um, Prophet Muhammad, who, according to the Islamically authentic texts, um, married uh, one of his wives Aisha when she was um, six years old, and consummated the marriage when she was nine years old meaning he took her to bed when she when she was nine and he was in his 50s and people call this uh, child rape nowadays and he's yeah. basically saying how is this child rape when when the parents yeah. consented to it <laughs> yeah wild wild i don't think people understand uh and i think i don't think i understood exactly until i started traveling uh and i went to some different cultures where people are way different. Like if you, if you go to the UK, people are still kind of the same. And even if you go to parts of Western Europe, people are still kind of the same. If you go over to Eastern Europe, people start getting different. Uh, and I think it wasn't until I did some traveling in Eastern Europe um, and went to Dubai that I experienced, and, and more really, I think in Eastern Europe, different beliefs down to somebody's core. I think it's hard for Westerners who haven't traveled 
to understand somebody can think completely differently. Unacceptably differently. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh we have two more no three more clips um very interesting both islam and human rights are in 100 percent agreement that women are accountable if they break the law and that means islam and human rights are in 100 percent agreement that women should be beaten we only differ on who should do the beating you say <laughs> uh that was good that was good. Do you understand the logic? Like <laughs> that's a, that's a little bit. Yeah, I, he didn't take a lot. That's not how logic works. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, women can be beaten. Okay, that was a bit of a stretch. Yeah. So, in under human rights, there are laws, and people yeah. are punished by laws. So, therefore both of them agree that women should be beaten so what's the problem <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a good one that's a good one and like i'm probably more prone to laugh at these things but <laughs> but it's actually scary like that that's actually scary it's funny for me to laugh at it now here when everything is fine but like if that kind of way of thinking if suddenly that's how all your neighbors think then it's scary right I mean, it's it's a. I think it's a completely normal reaction to um, react to something that is shocking and absurd like this with laughter in the moment. But then, when you look at the reality of things, and what he said here is not just something that some guy online uh, argues. It is a reality in much of the Muslim world. Uh, that there was a survey um, from a few years back from Afghanistan where. Uh, over 90% of women or over 80% of women agree that men have the right to beat them for various reasons, including um, if they accidentally burn the food or uh, leave the house without asking for permission. And this is a reality. I mean, in, in a Western society, this is completely absurd. But in that world, even women are indoctrinated into believing that because it comes directly from the religion itself. It is the Quran, which says in chapter four, verse 34, that uh, that women are supposed to be obedient to their husbands. And uh, if they don't obey, then a man uh, may warn the woman, then separate beds and finally beat them. And it's like Muslims are authorized by the by their religious holy book itself to do that. Who are we to speak? Yeah. Do you think that uh, the women answering that study answered it because that is what they believe? Or do you think they answered it because, you know, out of concern that if they answered any other way, they'd be beaten? What a paradox, right? I mean, it's a thing that I thought about as well. I don't know. I, I still think it's, it's hard to know. It's hard to yeah. guess. It's hard to guess. And I would say that there are probably some, uh, some of those women probably don't really believe that, but they um, fear for reactions, yeah. which is why they give a certain answer. Or there are some who genuinely believe, well, this is the right thing. I might not like it, but this is how it is. I mean, uh, I had a, uh, if I may share a life experience from myself, I lived in Turkey yeah. for a while. After I grew up in Germany, I moved to Turkey, lived there for a while, and uh, I had a roommate, and he had a a girlfriend, which is a and like this is a very secular environment and relationship, but in the end, uh, both of those people are Muslims and they have Muslim values. So um, I'm at that, at that point an atheist already. I'm like mildly outspoken, not too much because I don't want to put myself in danger, even in Turkey. But uh, one day she asks me. Um, so why, why are you not a Muslim? Why don't you believe anymore? And I said, for different reasons. And she said something like, oh, don't you think life with Islam is much better? I said, no, I don't think so. And she said, well, why? And I was like, what do you really want me to show you? Yeah, sure. So I brought the Quran and opened that, uh, that verse and said, please read and tell me what it says. And she read it and she confirms to me that it says that men are allowed to beat their wives. And I'm like, uh, you are not a terribly, you know, badly educated backward person you are you know advanced you're secular this and that but do you agree that if you get married your 
husband has the right to beat you if you don't behave it. In the end, she was like, well, I mean, this is what our religion says. So wow. in, in the end, he should have the, I mean, somebody has to correct me. And I was like, yeah, but who is going to correct him? Are you going to correct him? And then she's like, it's, it's, it's up to Allah to judge, not me. So this is what people accept yeah. because they are indoctrinated with it. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work with me at all. <laughs> that wouldn't, I couldn't, that wouldn't work with me at all. I'd just end up dying probably. <laughs> I can imagine that, but that, I mean, that, yeah, that, <laughs> that's what I mean. Like there is this fundamental difference in viewing society and viewing genders and uh, the role of the individual uh, between a Western or even a Christian perspective and a Muslim perspective. And I feel like many people fail to see this. <laughs> yeah. I think people aren't ed like, I think people aren't educated and people are educated in like the Western version of Islam which yeah. is like a hijab and that's about it. Oh yeah. Right? <laughs> like That's about it. And, and even there we have these interesting discussions of uh, people arguing that the hijab is actually a liberating thing, which. I mean, yeah. Is... That never, that never like worked for me. I heard that too in university too. It's like, no, people choose to wear it. It's liberating because then you don't get judged based on how you look. And I was like, just give me a break. That's not even a good argument. Like, no, I don't know what the response to that is just no anyway I mean, it's one thing to um make the personal decision one day and to say hey you know what i want to cover myself up just because i i don't want to deal with people's opinions and all that and then you go out and live your life that way. okay fine but the hijab is not that and the hijab is a compulsory um veil commanded directly in the scripture that women must wear uh, and fundamentally, it was so that women are Muslim women are distinguished as the honorable uh, women of the Muslims, as opposed to the, the the dishonorable disbelievers and prostitutes and slaves. So that was the distinction there. It's not like you have the you have the uh, a freedom there. You are you are supposed to wear it, and then afterward you make excuses about why it's actually a good thing. And mm -hmm. that's, that's not yeah, the yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things I think I found interesting that, uh, where was I going to go with this? No, we'll come back to it. I've forgotten. It was something Muhammad said. I'll, I'll remember. You mean, you mean Muhammad hijab, you guessed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Muhammad hijab. Okay. So we don't talk about the wrong people because Muhammad is also the prophet Muhammad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Muhammad hijab. All right, moving on to the next one. We have only two left. Oh, here, speaking of Mohammed Hijab. Here, Mohammed Hijab with 581,000 subscribers says, I believe certain anti-Muslim women would wish they lived in the medieval period, a period where if a war was won by the opposing side, it was conventional that people could be taken as booty. Some historical accounts actually say some women would dress up for the capture. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I don't... He live he he's he like lives in the UK, right? Isn't he at Oxford? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really know what to like I have no I don't even know what kind of response to have to that. I believe that some people He would like how does he know? Also, how, like how does he know if he won't, wouldn't even look at me during an interview? Well, he believes. That's what he says. He believes. Oh, he believes. Okay. Well, that's probably that's probably accurate. I, it's it's a very interesting thing. I mean, what he's basically saying is that um, anti-Muslim women, meaning by by that he means people who criticize or don't like Islam or Muslims. I don't know in the West, actually secretly want to be captured by Muslim warriors and be taken as, you know, sex slaves. And, and that's, that's every woman's dream. When I grow up, I want to be a sex slave. Yep. <laughs> Secret fantasies. Nope. No, it's out. Everyone knows it. <laughs> <laughs> and finally related, and finally related to that, uh, a final clip, and then we can move on with our conversation. I just think this is very interesting, one. very relevant to Western society. When Muslims go and conquer 
the, the adjacent country. The Prophet says, the first thing you do is call them to Islam. If they accept it, leave them. Khalas, they're Muslims. We go. If they refuse, then tell them Allah obliged upon you to pay taxation. Jizya. When enemy comes and attack your country, you don't fight. We Muslims protect you. But the ruling is for Sharia. So you do not open nightclubs. You do not uh, fornicate in the streets. You do not. No, Sharia rules. If they refuse, then we have to fight. And if we fight you, then we capture you. You become our slaves and we take your land and you take where because you refuse. I give you two good options. This is the strength of Islam. But nowadays, forget this, maybe in the, in the coming 40, 50 years when the Muslims become strong as they're supposed to be. Uh, just <laughs> yeah, yeah. if they refuse, I, yeah. he actually says something two, here. Two good options. Two good <laughs> options. You didn't go along with it. Yeah. And the, the two good options are uh, either listen to us and convert to Islam right now. Option number two is become our subjects and pay protection money. It's yeah. it's basically what what's what what gangs do, right? So. You pay protection money to the Muslim forces, and then you live your life with their rules. If you don't pay, then you are fair game. But as long as you pay, then they will take care of protecting you and all that. But if you refuse that too, if you just want to go on with your freedoms, then I'll give you two good options. <laughs> two good options, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And here's one thing. He actually says something very important that you often hear and that some people perceive as fear-mongering or um, whatever you may call it. But what he's saying is, right now this doesn't work, but maybe in 40, 50 years, when the Muslims are strong, yeah. as they should be, then we can go out and start conquering neighboring people and you know, force them again to do these things. Yeah. This is concerning it, you. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. And I think that people... <laughs> I think people in the West, I mean, maybe now, maybe with what people have seen with Russia and Ukraine, uh, maybe people are tr kind of getting the idea that conquering could still happen. I think people in the West believe that that's just what happened hundreds of years ago and doesn't happen anymore. And that's over. Um, and then, and it's not over for a lot of societies. I, th I think probably for most societies other than Western society. And so we already saw what happened with Russia, which is they went into the Ukraine and they've been, you know, going into other lands, which is kind of the same idea. Uh, and it's like, well, how could somebody do that? It's like, well, they think completely differently than we do. And so, yeah, 40 to 50 years. And is that just calculated by the rate at which it's growing, mostly due to the fact that people in the West aren't having kids? I mean, what you, um, I, I guess what's, um, or the, the general view that people like him um, or even mainstream uh, Muslim imams hold, or I mean, this, this was even coming in my own family. My own parents taught me that we as Muslims were strong and we conquered the world and we're proud of that and happy. But then unfortunately, due to uh, inner corruption and the West and this and that, we got defeated and slowed down in the last century. But uh, soon our time will come and we will grow again. We will gather our strength and then we will start conquering the world again. And people will convert to Islam in masses because, you know, we gave them two good options and they didn't accept. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this is generally um, what he and people like him think. You brought up a good point. It's that uh, people in very comfortable societies like the West are not very much familiar with the realities of, uh, you know, warfare and conquest and all that, because um, it looks like it's something of the past, because it didn't happen in recent times, in recent generations. The generation isn't familiar with this. But in Muslim societies, for example, people don't view it as a thing of the past, which is behind yeah. us and can't happen again. People view it as something that is supposed to happen again soon ish soon ish yeah wow that's wild that's and, wild and i i for example i grew up with um the idea 
so I grew up with this whole idea that um, that the world will probably come to an end soon. And before the world comes to an end, uh, prophecies made by Muhammad will uh, come true. They will happen. Uh, some of them are that um, an, an Islamic equivalent of the Antichrist called the Dajjal will appear and come from the West or from East or whatever it is. And um, with him, the disbelievers and a large number of Jews will come and will attack the Muslims. And there is a... Oh, wow. There is a clear report in which Muhammad says, uh, "Before the end is, before the hour is established, you will fight the Jews and you will uh, kill every single one of them, until some of them hide behind rocks and trees. And even the rocks and trees tell you there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. Uh, but only one tree, which is called the Gargat tree, will not give the Jews away because because the, the, that tree is also one of them. This is a mainstream Muslim belief." attested, confirmed in uh, the scripture, which Muhammad definitely said by Islamic standards. And I, I grew up learning that. And people still grow up learning that. People still believe in that stuff. So. That's, yeah, wow. I didn't know that there was that part written about Jews. Yeah. I'm not I mean, familiar with that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's that's... something that's, it's it's not even it's not even possible for me to make it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's just yeah. I, I okay. I suppose I've heard from. You know, I mean, it's a Christian belief that at some point the world is going to end. Jesus mm -hmm. is going to come back, um, but I don't think there's a great battle where Christians kill everybody. Well, Jews mostly. I hope not. Uh, <laughs> I hope not. Uh, oh, wild. But, I mean, let's, let's have a look at this uh, so that um, people don't call me a liar later. Uh, can you see this? Yep. So um, this is in uh, one of the two major books of reports about Muhammad, um, the Prophet Muhammad. And it says, Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger is saying, the last hour would not come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews. And the Muslims would kill oh, unless. them. Unless. Yeah, it will not come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews. So the last hour uh, will only come after this happens. Yeah. This okay. will definitely take place and then the hour will come. And the oh Muslims God. would kill them until the Jews would hide themselves behind a stone or a tree. And a stone or a tree would say, Muslim or the servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. But the tree Gargat would not say, for it is the tree of the Jews. <laughs> wow. Oh, I didn't know that at all. That's scary, too. The last hour would not come unless, which is yeah. kind of encouraging, right? It's like, well, yeah. if you want the last hour to come, this is what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I learned this stuff when I was... Um, I don't know. I, I, have, I have a memory of being in first or second grade. Uh, as a little child, going to religious gatherings with my family. And uh, one morning after the weekend, after a religious gathering of hearing these things about stuff that's probably going to happen soon, I am at school in the morning talking to my little friend, who is, I don't know, how old are you when you're in first or second grade? And, like and, six or seven. Yeah. And, and I tell him about these things and he's like, oh, really? Wow. I'm, I'm so scared. And, you know, we need to, we need to, uh, we need to warn uh, others too about this. I mean, we are stupid little kids, yeah, and we yeah. are being taught that we will we will fight the Jews. That is how we are programmed. We will fight them and we will kill them, and then the hour will come. This will definitely happen. There's no way out. <laughs> that's that's crazy. So I've been uh, doing a lot of like Bible reading, particularly since last August. And like I said earlier, I was kind of familiar with the biblical stories because of my dad, but I've actually gone through the text since last August. And my takeaway from most of it, it's the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that it basically teaches, it, it teaches ways that I believe would improve your life. So whether or not you uh, are a Christian or believe in God, it's some of the rules, which is kind of like, don't lie. Like no matter what, don't lie. And, you know, don't steal. And it, a lot of it's about not 
hurting other people and that it's not your job to judge other people, mm -hmm. that you should leave that up to God. And all of those lessons, I think, whether or not you believe in God or are religious, and like, I think those are good lessons to instill in people. So I think people, you know, um, I probably more atheist types. There's a lot of judging the really religious Christians, like evangelical Christians online. It's like, what are they teaching their kids that evolution doesn't exist and all this? And it's like, you, pro probably, yes, probably they are being taught that. But some of the other lessons that are like, don't lie, don't steal, um, love everybody. It's like, it's not that scary. Right, it's kind of a <laughs> hippie <laughs> religion. Yeah, I mean, uh, my reaction is always when um, when people tell me about how terrible Christianity is because uh, you know people learn I don't know about gender roles or uh, that evolution is not true and things like this. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? I mean, give me a break. Okay, I, I get it, <laughs> I get it, but I just have to compare things here i come from a background where that stuff is very very mild to me and i said i sat down and read uh parts of the new testament much of it actually and uh for most of it from the very beginning i felt i felt like wow this is this is peaceful this is new stuff i read the quran multiple times before and i thought this is uh this appeals to something very good in me of uh you know uh loving and forgiveness and accepting also repentance and also aspects that i mm -hmm. don't agree with oh, some some of them like i don't know I, I feel like it has too much of a sense of humiliate like self humiliation more than uh humility uh and i think that some aspects of it may, may be too judgmental of humans and human behavior but then again it teaches a lot of values that contribute to a uh, good life, whether I believe in this or not, that's the reality. When I compare this to other religions, though, um, it's it's very hard to say that all religions have these very good aspects, and that all religions have good aspects that overshadow the the bad sides. I mean, with a religion like Islam, for example, you don't you don't just learn to love and to forgive and to accept. You learn to judge and to hate and to fight. And this is not what I'm saying. This is evidently, as you can see, what these people are saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's dangerous it is it is it is pretty bad so yeah um i think i was very upfront with you about um how i i, I wanted to talk to you about these things about uh our perspective on the whole islamic issue about the presence of um ex-muslims which i think um this is something that uh as ex-muslims we don't find enough um support and uh solidarity from people in the west neither from the progressive uh, leftists because they are kind of afraid of the backlash from muslims and they uh confuse our existence with this uh stereotypical right-wing propaganda and we also mm -hmm. don't find it very much from uh the conservative or you know classical liberal people because uh again for various different reasons i have no idea why but um, it, it might be it's probably the same reasons it's fear of backlash and then a big one would probably just not being familiar like mm -hmm. i'd never heard um of pretty much anything that you just showed me well now i know right but it, so it's probably just not not being educated and then uh, fear of backlash and probably being open to ideas, right? Because it's good to be open. So you're like, well, can't all be bad, right? And or you know, it maybe I'm misunderstanding parts of it. Like that's probably what my view has been for most of it. Is like maybe I'm missing something. I hear all these negative things, particularly about women's rights. Maybe I'm missing something because I haven't read the Quran. I don't know who I'm listening to. I would always suggest re reading the Quran and uh, getting your own impression of it. I, I always suggest doing it um, as a complete opponent of the Quran and of Islam. I say the best thing that you could do is to read the Quran. You don't even need my input. You will uh, you, you will see what I'm talking about. Uh, but after our conversation, yeah. after everything you've seen today, uh, how do you feel? Do you now feel uh, closer to converting to Islam or? No, you're definitely not working in Islam's favor. I can tell you that much. Um, although I wasn't close before. 
but uh, no. Yeah. You must yeah. get a lot of a lot of hate online. Oh, I do. I get I get death threats. Yeah, that's all the time. Yeah, that's scary. I recently started a cartoon. Actually, that's the first time that uh, that a cartoon series exists. I just started a cartoon series called The Prophet Tales, where through uh, cartoon, through art, and through humor, um, I and a friend are telling the story of uh, Muhammad and the things that he said and did. Um, you should really check that out. I think um, that's I, I will I will uh, that will grow and will get much bigger. Uh, I would say I really appreciate you coming here. And uh, I think I would really appreciate it if you became uh, an ally of sorts. I don't want to drag you into any fights or anything, but if uh, people like you could give um, uh, ex-Muslims and critics of Islam, people who speak from the other perspective, who are not heard very much, uh, a voice, you know, if you can uh, show some solidarity and some help. And you have already done that with Ayan Hirsi Ali, which I think uh, was very significant and very great. I think uh, lots of people would appreciate this because I come from a world and uh, many people that I know come from a world where we don't have a voice. We cannot speak out. We are in constant danger. And the funny and ironic and uh, tragic thing is we come from the Muslim world, from countries where we are threatened with death and violence and all that. Then we come to the West to find, uh, you know, freedom and, mm -hmm. and all that here. And suddenly in the West, we are, we see everyone saying, hey, Islam is a beautiful religion. Hey, don't be a bigot. Hey, don't do this. Don't do that. And we are like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. Um, I think before before I go, what made you decide to kind of pursue telling people about Islam kind of full time? Well, I started at some point, um, I went online when I was, uh, after I stopped believing in Islam and looked for answers and for voices online. And I mostly saw this whole new atheist community of people in the West just criticizing Christianity and there wasn't much being said about Islam. And even when there was something about Islam, it was mostly misinformation. There weren't many people, you know, speaking in detail about Islam. And I have a past where I tried to practice Islam and study Islam for many years. I thought, I know something. I would like to go out and give people accurate information and counter uh, Muslim apologists and preachers, counter leftists who defend Islam ignorantly and also counter those who spread different sorts of misinformation. I started doing this, it quickly spread. And then I thought, okay, this is, this is, this, this works. And I feel very passionate about this. I need to focus on this. I need to do this because I know I have uh, suffered from Islam growing up in a very religious family. And I know people um, who suffered much worse. My experience is nothing in comparison to theirs. I know people who fled their families and their uh, countries, whose parents want to kill them, uh, who are under a death sentence and you know, decades of uh, prison sentences and things like that. Uh, all of that due to Islam, not due to some you know, radicals or uh, extremists or whatever you call it. But this is a serious problem, a serious humanitarian problem. And People don't want to hear it. People don't hear it because Islam is dominant in that, in that, uh, in that culture. And here, people just care about Islam as a minority, which must be protected or feared. And that's where I feel like uh, people like me need to come in and tell people the truth. And we need as much help as possible to get the truth out there to everybody. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me on. That was. That was very interesting. Um, and I probably will read the Quran. Um, I, like I said, I had started at an early university and I read a, a whole bunch of it, uh, I, but I didn't get through it for sure. Um, just like I never got through the Bible until this year. Um, but that's probably a good place to start. Mm -hmm. No, but definitely, definitely suggest it. Um, uh, yeah, no, thank you so much for for coming. I really appreciate you um, responding well to this and coming on here. 
it was um, a lot of fun going through these things. I appreciate what you do. I appreciate who you are. Uh, anything else that you want to add, want to say? If we, anything you want to plug it, go ahead. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. That was good. I mean, um, if anybody wa is watching, anybody who's watching is interested in my podcast, they can just look up Michaela Peterson podcast. It was pretty easy. Um, but yeah, that was really interesting. Thank you very much again for the invite and following up, even though I was sick for a very long time. No problems. So, what matters is you. that you're here in the end. And I hope to keep in touch and to talk to you again uh, in the future at some point. Um, thanks so much. And thanks everyone for watching. Thank you, Michaela. Have a fantastic day, everybody. And as I always say, stay away from us. Now. <laughs>